and welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith, and in this Kickstarter preview, we're going to be checking out Dragon Bond Lords of Vala from Draco Studios. This is currently on Kickstarter of the release of this video. You'll find the links to that Kickstarter in the pinned comment and video description. And if you're wondering about what Lords of Vala is, it's an asymmetric strategy game for one to four players. Absolutely plays solo. And you can play as a general managing your army and resources or play as a dragon, destroying your foes and laying waste to the land. To win the game, you got to overcome the odds, plan your strategy, and collect the most Vala. The first player to amass 10 power tokens will claim victory, or if you're dragon bonded, then it will be 15 power tokens. For many millennia, the lands of Valerna have suffered the raids of dragons. Every 27 years when the red moon rises, dragons ravage the world of mortals and the nations of Valerna stop their infighting to face the invasion. And some say the dragon bond, the fabled union of dragon and mortal essences, has returned after a thousand years, which could change the course of the war and the destiny of both worlds. Two generals and two dragons boast powerful maneuverability and fearsome strength when dealing with individual threats, and nothing, however, is more powerful than their combined forces, and the course of the entire game can be changed when a general and a dragon end a turn in the same region, resulting in a mighty dragon bond. The objective of Lords of Vala is a game about power. You're trying to raise your armies, destroy your enemies, cast mighty spells, and you're trying to collect as much power as possible. Once you've collected 10 power tokens, or as I mentioned earlier, 15 power tokens with a dragon bonded ally, you win the game immediately. Let's quickly go over the setup of the game to give you an idea as to everything that's here on the table, and then we're going to jump into a full round of play to give you an idea as to how this game flows and operates. The very first step of setup is of course to place the empty game board down on the table and then next you're going to choose which of these characters you wish to control. You have two dragons on the left and two generals on the right. Once you've decided which character you wish to control, in my case I'm choosing to control a general, Alaria, I've gone ahead and placed the Dragon Bond card for Alaria in the top right hand section of her player board. The remaining generals and dragons, in this case we have Fulgen here, and Fulgen is a dragon. Each of them are going to be flipped over to the AI side as we're going to have three other AIs going against us, and you can see that in the top right hand corner of each of the player boards. These AI players are referred to in the rulebook as faceless players. The next thing you need to ensure is that you have the dragons and the generals laid out in a particular order. So it's going to start left to right with a dragon, which is off screen in light blue, Falgan. Then Illyria is a general. Next to Illyria, we have Magnifix, which is a dragon. And then Tiveria on the far right off screen in purple, which is another dragon. Next, you're going to want to find the miniatures for each of the four different factions or characters, and you're going to want to set them up in their home locations, which are depicted in the rule book, but you can see them right here. The dragons are situated on the north and south points of the map. There are no units in their spaces. On the east and west side of things, you have the two generals, and you'll notice inside of each of their home or starting locations, you're going to have a number of units, and there should be one of each of them. So we have an infantry, a cavalry, and a ranged unit. You'll notice on the right-hand side, with Tiveria, uh, there's actually two infantry units, and that's just because in this prototype, I didn't have the ranged unit token inside of it. So I'm just using an infantry one to represent it. Next, each of the human players, so in this case, when playing solo, I'm the only human player, I'm gonna take my hand of action cards. There are five of them, and I'm showing you the back of what those cards look like as well. In addition to these action cards in your hand, you're also, as a general, because I'm controlling a general, I'm going to get the region card that associates itself with the starting region I've begun in. And I'm Alaria, and I'm starting in Alaria, so I get that card and it will go into my hand for a total of six cards. Next up, each human player is going to take their Vala cards, shuffle them together, and place them onto their player boards in the bottom right hand corner. This now forms the Vala deck. You can see it right here. It's worth mentioning all the AI player boards do not use Vala cards when they're being controlled as faceless players. 
Moving right along to the Faceless Players, setup is very, very easy. Even though you're controlling three other factions when playing solo, it's a very streamlined process. You're basically going to have the player board, as I mentioned earlier, on the AI side facing up. You'll also grab the action card deck for the corresponding faction or character that you're controlling, and you're going to shuffle that deck together, and that's it. You'll do this for each of the factions with one difference. Make sure that any faceless generals also have their unit tokens ready. And as I mentioned earlier in the setup, I don't have the ranged unit tokens for Tiberia, but I do have the ranged tokens for Illyria. And Illyria is the one I'm going to be controlling another general. Remember, generals are moving armies in this game, so these tokens need to be within easy reach. Next, you're going to want to take the upgrade cards. You're going to want to shuffle this deck, and then you're going to want to draw six upgrade cards, placing them face up into a line adjacent to the board. Now, normally this would be a line left all the way through to right, but just based on spacing for me, I put them top left to bottom right in terms of order. Next step is to shuffle the event card deck and place them in the slot designated on the game board for them. Any remaining tokens, including neutral unit tokens or dragon bonded tokens, you'll also see inside the game trays there, the very first tray closest to you is the power tokens, whether they're charged up or they've been used, white versus black. Then above that, you've got the wound tokens with the blood drip. And then above that, you have the city tokens. The next step is for every single empty region, and of course right now the board is populated, but if there was only four miniatures on the game board, only four regions would have been filled in at this point. So for all the empty regions, as you see here, you'll have one neutral infantry unit sitting in each of those empty regions, plus a white power token, and that's all filled in now. I also went ahead and corrected from earlier shots this location right here, which did not have a power token and infantry unit inside of it. So now we're all squared away. We're still part in the setup right now anyway and the final thing you need to do is to place the initiative token to the last player who watched a movie featuring a dragon but when you're playing solo you're going to get that initiative token anyway so that's going to be set just above of course you don't need to even keep this in play you know you'll be the uh, first player every single time so you could just take this token and remove it from the game if you so choose that's going to do it for the setup, and now we can move into the round of play to give you an idea as to how this game actually operates, and it's really important, again, to hammer home. The objective of the game is all around power tokens. We are trying to collect 10 as an individual faction or character. So, as Alaria, for me right now, I'm trying to get 10 power tokens that are going to fill up the track on my player board in order to make me the winner, while the AI or faceless players are doing the exact same thing. Now, there is this thing around dragon-bonded and when that happens, you're going to have a general and a dragon basically becoming a team. But then at that point, the power token requirement to win jumps to 15. So let's head right into the planning phase. At the start of a round, you place an event card face down within reach of all players. This begins the action stack. Starting with the player with the initiative token, which is me, and continuing clockwise around, each player or each faceless player is going to place an action or a region card face down from their hand onto the action stack. And in this way, the players are choosing what they will do during the resolution phase. So taking a look at my hand of cards here, you'll see icons in the bottom left hand corner of each of these cards are going to tie into abilities that your particular faction or player actually has the ability to use. You'll also see some icons like this one from the region card that are not on this board, but I'll be explaining those when we actually hit it. So I'm going to be going ahead and playing through a number of cards, setting them up in order to maneuver, assault, harvest, and use some Vala cards in order to try and obtain as many power tokens as possible. And this is where the strategy comes in. Now, one thing that is absolutely worth mentioning is you're going to see these abilities spelt out on all of the player boards. However, behind the scenes, I have an updated version of all of these abilities as there's been tweaks to the prototype since these were printed. So don't take the abilities as written during this video that you see on the table verbatim as to what the rules currently are. I've got some additional tweaks behind the scenes and I'll be talking you through them as we go. So I've gone ahead and placed my very first card on top of the action stack and it was a maneuver card. That's what I'm planning on doing is doing some maneuvering right out of the gates and we'll work towards some other stuff in a little bit. So then we go to the next player, in this case a faceless player, and there will be three of them in a row and simply draw the top card off the deck and place it on the stack. So you're going to see three cards landing in that deck. 
So as you can see here, we now have the event card that started the action stack for the planning phase. We have my card, which was a maneuver card that I placed in there, and then one card from the top of each of the faceless player decks. We're now back around to my turn, so I have to select another card from my hand that I'd like to put in next. It's worth mentioning, when this stack is finally completed, it's going to be flipped over, and it's going to be revealed and resolved in order. So you are placing cards in here in the order you wish to have them resolved from the very first thing you want to do to the very last thing you want to do. Now it's worth mentioning that faces players will never pass when they're trying to place cards into this action stack and they can never gain the initiative token. So it always comes back to you to decide, do you want to place another card in the stack or do you want to pass? And when you get to a point in the planning phase where you want to pass because you no longer want to do anything that's on the cards in your hand, then you choose to pass and we are now done as a solo player. Nothing else gets added to the deck. And that's where we're at right now. So just to sum things up, I had six cards in my hand and in turn, we did four full turns worth of cards each from myself as well as the faces players which have now combined into this action stack and the final thing we do is we place the event card a new one from the top of that deck onto the top of this one and we're going to flip that deck over and that's going to begin the resolution phase and just like that we begin the resolution phase with a year of turmoil this event states place a neutral unit in each empty or neutral region so literally because the board right now all of the neutral control regions are the ones that have power tokens and a neutral unit in it they're going to get an additional unit in each of them making them even stronger so the game board goes from looking like this to looking like this instead which is a little bit more concerning so with the Year of Turmoil now resolved, we can take that card and discard it. We'll be moving on down through the action stack, and we know that Illyria, which is myself, is going to be going next. But just before we do that, let's talk about these five dice you're seeing on screen, probably wondering why did they not look so hot? Well, it's because I used a black marker on these crystal clear dice in order to denote which ones were critical hits versus standard hits, but I want you guys to know, again, everything you're seeing in this upcoming gameplay here is in prototype form including any wording, any of the components. The final dice are going to be, from my understanding, black dice with white for the symbols or icons around the dice, so you'll have no trouble seeing them. But for this prototype copy, I had to use a permanent marker in order to denote those and make them a little more visible for you guys when you're watching. The bottom of each of the cards are some flavor text for you to enjoy as you're going through the gameplay. So let's go ahead and discard this one and go ahead with my maneuver because, well, I remember that was my very first action I wanted to do. It's now my turn to go ahead. The card on the top of the action stack is a maneuver card for me, and this is going to give me the ability to maneuver. I want to make a mention, though, about the icon in the bottom left-hand corner. Those are the icons you're going to be looking at when resolving during this resolution phase. So there could be multiple icons in a stack here, maybe two or three or more, and if you're resolving them, you're going to be resolving them always from top to bottom, never bottom to top, and if you can't perform a particular glyphs action, Action, you're just going to simply skip it. Now, it's worth mentioning, for the abilities that are printed on the player-controlled side of the boards here, I'm actually going to be using them as they are written. It is only the AI side of the board that I'll be using variations as there's been corrections to the way the AI has worked, as I mentioned earlier on. But here on my player board, it'll tell you right away what that icon or glyph means. So, maneuver. Move up to four Alarian units to adjacent empty or friendly regions when moving units from a region containing a city you may move them to a region connected by a sea region so with this maneuver glyph i need to make a decision here and based on the text i can only move to an adjacent empty region or a friendly region and neither of those actually exist with the current board state. So another option you have when you get the maneuver glyph is you can choose to actually bolster your ranks by adding two additional units to them instead. And I think that's exactly what I'm gonna do. Two more units have been added to my army over there in Alaria, And it's important to note those recruited units that I chose to get instead of moving somewhere because I don't really have the option to move at this point in the game state have to be placed where your general is. So that's why they're there. The other thing I wanna mention is the difference between general 
Admirals, which you can see on the east and west side of the board versus north and south Dragons. The difference between them is that Dragons are not considered units at all, so they are not going to determine whether a region is controlled or uncontrolled. They are going to go in and out of regions at will and do their thing. Whereas the Generals are going to be placing units down in order to control regions, just like the neutral armies that exist within the land. The next action card on the action stack is for Magnifex, and it is going to be a Wrath Glyph. And this glyph states, move the dragon one region towards the focused region. The focused region is always the region with the most power tokens, but right now, if there's a tie, which there is, because many different regions have just one, then it's going to default to the initiative token, which is sitting with me currently, meaning that I get to decide where this dragon's going to go. So, knowing this, it will be moved, the dragon will be moving one region towards the focus region which I'll pick then it's going to try to initiate combat if possible and if the dragon did not move and did not initiate combat then one power token is collected. I'm going to choose the Magnifex dragon to swoop into this region right here. And at this point, because there are neutral units in there and the dragons in there, a combat is going to be initiated. Now, the dragon initiated the fight due to the glyph on its card. So we'll take a look at the AI side of the player board here and you'll note its health here and there's damage that can be taken, which will reduce the number of dice that are used in combat. But because there's no damage on this dragon right now, it gets a full four dice. So Magnifex is going to be the attacker coming in with a combat value of four, meaning the dragon itself gets four dice to roll. Now, hypothetically, if this was the roll that landed, which it wasn't, I'm going to roll it in a second here, but I want to explain to you what this dragon might be hoping to get. So basically, when a roll happens, and this is the result, we have two blanks up top, so we'll ignore those, but you'll see a couple different squares that are highlighted, but they're not filled in. Those are considered critical hits. You really want to see those as an attacker because critical hits deal wounds immediately before the defender gets a chance to actually decide whether to retreat or to counterattack back. So in the case when you're playing against the AI, the faceless players are always going to try and counterattack each other back and forth. So this dragon really does want to land two critical hits to wipe these two units off the board so they don't even get a chance to do that. But how this resolution works is you roll these dice, critical hits would go into effect, let's say hypothetically instead of two I only got one then one of these units would be removed immediately then you take a look at the defending units determine how much combat value they have in this case there'd be one remaining we would roll a single die for that group and then we would compare standard hits but the defenders hits would land first and then finally the attackers standard hits would land all right, so with that all said, let's go ahead and roll the dice, see how this pans out. So Magnifex is attacking. Let's see what we get. Oh my gosh, two criticals. That's all that needed to happen in a whole bunch of standard hits. So before the defense even gets a chance to come back, there is no chance at all. The dragon just wipes out everybody there. One other thing that's happening on game boards for the faceless players that are dragons that's important to note is, as you saw earlier on, when individual units are consumed by a dragon, they are placed on this track here. Once three are collected, it is cashed in for a power token. So that is another way that the dragons are generating these tokens. Now it's also important to know that just because a battle was won and an area has now been completely removed of control from these neutral units, it doesn't mean that the dragon then automatically gains this power token. Based on its glyph, it just comes in and attacks. There are ways that this dragon will accumulate power tokens, but it doesn't just automatically get this one. Next up is Tiberia. They have an Assault Glyph and underneath of it a Vala Glyph. So the Assault Glyph states to place a Tiberian unit in the General's region. So they're going to bolster their ranks. Then move the General to an adjacent region closest to the Focus region. That region is the battlefield. Move all but one Tiberian unit from each region adjacent to the battlefield and then initiate combat in the battlefield. So battle is up first. Another unit has been added and this certainly helps because now the entire army minus just one of those units is going to stay in its home territory while the rest of them are going to move west towards the focus region. 
We're all ready to go, and the combat value of the general is two dice plus the individual infantry units that were brought in. So that's another three, so five dice to be rolled on the attack. Let's see how many critical hits can possibly land here. We got ourselves, oh wow, a lot. We got ourselves three total. That is going to wipe out all the neutral units. And it's worth noting that only the dragons have the ability to collect these units as almost trophies. The generals, however, are just wiping out individuals off the board so that's exactly what just happened general moved in wiped out a neutral unit or all the neutral units and now controls that region the next glyph on the card is all around Vala, and if able, you're going to spend two power and move a Tiverian general directly to the focused region, then place three Tiverian units in that region and initiate combat there. Thankfully, they don't have power tokens collected, enough of them yet, they need two, in order to flip them over to use them to activate that ability. And just to close the loop on this action card, we know that last glyph I just talked about we can't do because there's no power tokens here for this particular group. However, if there had been two, they'd be sitting like this. And then when we decide to use them based on a glyph telling us if able, we can spend them, which would be in this situation right now, you'd flip them over like so in order to use them. Next, we move to Fulgen, another dragon, and this time it is going to be a sore action. It says, if Fulgen is in the focus region, collect one power instead. Otherwise, move Fulgen two regions toward the focus region. It's worth noting he can fly over bodies of water. So what I'm going to do strategically is place this dragon that's up north in a region that has no power tokens. I don't want to put it in a region where it could potentially get one. So maybe moving it from where it is up north to the trade road makes the most sense. And again, I get to choose the focus region because at this point in the game, there's only one power token on each of these different regions. You will see later on that that is going to change. And that's going to end off this action card. Let's move on to the next one. This card is for me and it's called Assault. It lets me choose a region to be the battlefield. I get to move any number of my Alarian units from adjacent regions and city regions connected by sea to that battlefield. And then we initiate combat in the battlefield. So I'm going to choose that this area right here become the battlefield so I'm able to move any number of my units from adjacent regions over even if there is a sea separating them or a body of water. So what I'm going to do is actually leave behind a handful of the units so I'm not taking everybody. So my strategy here is I still want to control the region I just left, but I also want to bring enough firepower to deal with these neutral units. It's worth noting when you're determining your combat value for an attack, you're going to get a bonus combat value if you have one of each of the different unit types. So that's one of the reasons why I brought these three over. So I have two for my general, one for each of them, and then an additional one on top of it for the set. So a total of six dice being rolled. So I'm going to go ahead and roll these dice and we'll re-roll any blanks as one extra roll that will make my six because I only have five in this prototype. There's a blank right there, so we'll re-roll this one. So we have two standard hits, three standard hits, and two critical strikes. Perfect. That means those two neutral units have been removed without any chance to defend. Now it's worth clarifying something here because when you're playing against faceless players, they're always, if they're alive after your critical hits have landed, are always going to try and count counter-attack, right? That's always going to happen. So if they're still standing, they're going to try to hit you back. If you're playing with other players, however, after that initial attack roll, the defender gets a choice as to whether or not they're going to bother trying to defend it or they're going to just straight up retreat. So when playing with other players or humans around the table, the strategies and things are going to change. Whereas when you're playing against the AI or faceless players, they're just going to continue bombarding you no matter what and not relent on that. Moving along to the Dragon Magnifix, uh, we have another Wrath Glyph. So the Dragon will be moving one region towards the Focus region, then initiating combat if possible, and if it didn't move and didn't initiate combat, collecting one power token instead. For now, I'm going to actually choose to have the Dragon move from where it is back to its original home location. Now you might be wondering why I'm doing this and it's strategy in two different ways and it all comes down to dragon bonded and whether I am or I'm not. If I'm not dragon bonded, which I am not from the beginning of the game, then my strategy is to try to get power tokens alone by themselves with my units in those same regions. So when I get a harvest glyph, I'll be able to actually obtain those power tokens. If there are other units or dragons in those regions with those power tokens, it makes it that much harder to 
to try and get power tokens with Illyria. So that's my strategy at this point in time. However, if I was dragon bonded with that dragon, it would actually be on my team and on its turn right now when it was doing that uh, wrath glyph i could have chosen to leave it right here and instead not move it at all on purpose in order for it to gain a power token from the pool not from the region it's currently sitting in but from the pool of tokens in the tray for now i'm happy with my decision and we can move on to the next action card Next up, Tiberia is going to activate, and it's a Harvest Glyph. This is the first one we've seen. It says, for each region that doesn't contain a dragon, collect power tokens equal to the number of Tiberian units in that region. For each region with no dragons and no Tiberian units, place a unit in the General's region. So the first part of the Harvest is all about collecting power in regions that are equal to the number of Tiberian units in that region. So as of right now, the only one that I can collect is the one where the general is currently sitting in as I have units in there there's no dragon. So Tiberia has gained the very first power token of the game and it's from a general and just like me controlling a general, generals are the only ones that can take power tokens straight off of the map board itself. Dragons are going to take power tokens or collect them through the pool of tokens just off camera. So that's worth mentioning as well. Also, the second half of the harvest glyph that I read out just moments ago for Tiberia, that actually has been tweaked and changed. So if I happen to get a power Power token or even more than one power token I don't get the benefit of the additional units and I've also clarified that it's not going to be based on the fact of having a Tiberian unit or a dragon in a specific region it's just a matter of did you collect a power token or not and if you didn't during your harvest glyph then you're just going to get one additional unit added to where your general is currently seated so that's not going to happen here because a power token was taken but I'm pretty sure Tiberia is pretty happy with that as they're on their way to victory. So that power token has been placed on the track and they need 10 in order to win. Falgen is up next and has a Horde Glyph. It says, move Falgen one region towards the Focus region. Again, I can choose this as there's only one power token out in all the regions currently. Collect one power from Falgen's new region. If this region is uncontrolled, collect a second power. So I have a choice to move this dragon in a direction here. I could go north, I could go south, or I could go west. Now, if I go west, I'm moving it right into an area where there's a general, which would force Force a dragon bond roll to occur and if things lined up those two could end up teaming up so I'm going to try to avoid that situation I'd rather team up with a dragon myself rather than having two of the faceless players join forces so I might actually send the dragon south Falgen has moved into the new region. It is now going to collect the power token that is inside of it. If the region was uncontrolled, it would collect a second power token. In this case, just the one. A power token has now been placed on the track on its way looking for 10. It's come back around to my turn. We've got two glyphs on this one. So starting at the very top here, we have the Harvest Glyph and then underneath of it, a Vala Glyph. The Harvest Glyph allows me to collect power from each region that does not contain a dragon equal to the number of Valerian units in that region. So if I happen to have had three power tokens in here with the three units I have in here, I could have grabbed all of them. But unfortunately, I'll just be getting the one power token that's in there. And, and even more unfortunate is I don't have any units down in this area here to grab that one just yet. The next glyph is a Vala glyph. It says, choose a Vala card from your hand to cast. If you don't have one, draw a Vala card from your Vala deck and place it in your hand. So we're going to draw one right off the top here and see what we get. So the next time that I get a Vala Glyph, I'll be able to go ahead and use this card. It allows me to choose a region, then move up to six units into that region and initiate combat in it as well. This glyph is called Soar. It says, if Magnifex is in the focus region, collect one power instead. Otherwise, move the dragon two regions towards the focus region instead. I'm going to go ahead and have the dragon head two regions north. The dragon has now moved and it is up to Tiberia to go next. And it looks like it's going to be an assault. The Assault Glyph states that you're going to place a Tiberian unit in the General's region first, then move the General to an adjacent region closest to the Focus region. That region is the battlefield. Move all but one Tiberian unit from each region adjacent to the battlefield. Initiate combat in the battlefield. 
I've gone ahead and added a new unit to the general's location, and at this particular point, I'm going to choose to actually have the general move to the adjacent region and closest to the focus region. I'm going to have that focus region actually be where the dragon is right here in the woods. So I've gone ahead and moved the general in. We now have this general going up against neutral units as well as a dragon that's in there. And I get to choose which one it attacks first. So I'm actually gonna go ahead because I really want to try and beat up this general a little bit. I'm gonna go ahead and have the general go up against the neutral units first. So going into this with five dice. Let's see how this battle turns out for me strategically. I want to see them get really beat up. Oh, this is perfect. Look at that. So they only got, th they got four standard hits, which is really good, but no critical hits, which means because it's a faceless player, oh, actually it's not, it's a neutral uh, unit, which is going to automatically counter attack back. We're going to be rolling two dice back at the general. So hopefully they get some criticals in this. So let's go ahead and roll these two for the defense and two more blanks. Oh my gosh. So now because the defense put no criticals and no standard hits towards the general and its units the four standard hits that the attacker first got are now going to go across and they will completely wipe out all the neutral units but it doesn't stop there now there is a battle between the dragon and the general so we're going to take a look at rolling five dice right now because they didn't lose anything on that last battle and they are still the attacker so going into this one, oh, that was a bad roll for them. They only got one critical hit. So that critical hit is going to go on the board like so, and you'll see it could potentially affect how much of a combat value you have in terms of how many dice you roll if it gets too low for the dragon. So as of right now, this doesn't do much. The next one would do a lot of drop it from four down to two, but right now still rolling four back. And that first roll had zero standard hits from the attacker that we need to keep track of. So we're just gonna go ahead and grab four dice right now and see how much is coming back at the general from the dragon. Oh, that looks pretty painful. So two critical hits and then a number of standard hits. We just add them all together. So two, three, four, five, six. So at this point, the faceless player is forced to retreat as the general is the only one left. So in this case, it needs to go to either an empty or a friendly controlled location where it has units. And of course, there's one right there. And if that doesn't work out, there are other ways and criteria to retreat backwards. But one thing I want to touch on in combat is something that I missed when calculating out the hits and everything else. And that was this mountain icon right here. Now, if an attacker, as the general did, crosses over a mountain, mountain range into another region, the defending player is able to ignore one of the hits caused by the attack, whether it be critical or standard. So that means the one hit that came across and hit the dragon is actually going to be erased. There are also cities that can be created, and if the defending region has a city in it and the attack scores at least one hit, defending units, not dragons, ignore one of the hits caused by the attack, whether it's critical or standard, and the city is removed. Let's talk quickly about retreat. I really want to make sure you understand how retreating works. Now, when you're talking about a general who's retreating, they must choose an adjacent, friendly, or uncontrolled region and move all units from the region where the combat occurred to there. If there are no adjacent regions to retreat to, you remove all the units involved in the retreat and move any general involved in the retreat to the nearest friendly or uncontrolled region. If there are no friendly or uncontrolled regions anywhere on the board that player is eliminated from the game now when you're talking about dragons and them retreating from a region they must choose an adjacent region and move to that region dragons can retreat to uncontrolled or controlled regions if a dragon retreats to a region containing a general there is a chance of a dragon bond as i mentioned before now the dragon did a big time crunch on three units that were in that side that location. So three would be one extra here, and then this would reset and go back. There would be nothing here, another unit, and then another unit for a total of three. So we would actually increase the power for Magnifex by one based on that battle. So Falgan is going to go next, has a Wrath Glyph. This states to move Falgan one region towards the focus region, which I'm going to choose to be the one that has the infantry, or I should say the cavalry unit for Tiberius sitting inside of it at the trade road. That's where I'm going to move the dragon, and we're going to initiate an attack. Now, if nothing happened in terms of moving or attacking for this dragon, they'd be collecting one power token instead, but I don't want that to happen. I'd rather try and harm some of the other individuals or a general in this case. 
The dragon's going in with a combat value of four. Let's go ahead and roll the dice and see if we get enough critical hits to just wipe out the unit that's there, no problem. Oh yeah, easy. Two critical hits, that's gonna place the unit we killed off in the row down below. The next card coming up in the action stack is my region card that I placed in there. There's three glyphs to go through and all three of them are explained in the bottom left hand corner of the game board. A general player in control of this region may choose an upgrade card and place it onto their player board. So in the top left hand corner here we have a bunch of upgrade cards with abilities on them. At the very top of the card there's a location or region depicted on it. So it's talking about where my general currently is and what it's occupying which is this location right here, a region, and it's right there at the top so I'm going to go ahead and take this upgrade card and place it on my player board. You'll notice on my board that there is an icon not only on the card for the upgrade but also in each of the upgrade slots that correspond to each of the different unit types so in this case the ranged one needs to go in the ranged slot and this states that these individuals may count as cavalry ranged or infantry units when determining a balanced force. So that's pretty awesome. It gives the flexibility for my ranged units to be any of the other unit types so I can get that additional die bonus by having a complete set. Next up we have Reinforce. A general player in control of this region places a unit of their choice in the region and any adjacent regions they control. If the region is neutral or empty, place two neutral units in this region. Strategy wise for me this worked out really really well because not only can I add a unit into the location my general is currently in but the adjacent one right here and then on top of it this area down here will not be getting the two additional neutral units because there is a C crossing through it so they're not considered adjacent. So that worked out quite nicely I bolstered my forces and also got a couple sets going on as well. And last but not least, how do you get cities onto the game board, you wonder? Well, fortify. If there's no city in this region, place a city in this region. I'd say overall, that was a pretty fantastic turn. Magnifex is up next and we'll be doing a harvest action or glyph. So move Magnifex one region towards the focus region, collect one power from Magnifex new region. If this region is uncontrolled, collect a second power. Now as my strategy unveils and I try to pit together whether I want to try and gather 10 power tokens on my own or go for a dragon bond and go for 15, I kind of want to move Magnifix maybe a little bit closer to me so that we have the potential chance of forming a dragon bond. So I'm actually going to do that. So Magnifix is now close to me and there is no power token for it to collect from this new region and it is controlled by me so there's no second power token being collected either. Moving right along. Next up we have a Maneuver or Deploy Glyph, and this is for Tiveria, and it says to create a Tiverian unit in every uncontrolled region adjacent to a Tiverian region. Move the Tiverian General to a Tiverian region closest to the Focus region. If no units were placed, place three units in the General's location. I can tell you right now that this is a very, very powerful Glyph for Tiveria. They now spread out their army with one unit to all these uncontrolled regions around them. So now they have even more control than they did prior. And it's also worth mentioning you'll see a new unit sitting in the trade road region with the dragon. Because remember the dragon does not control a region. Next up, Falgen is going to activate with a glyph for Soar. And if Falgen is in the focus region, you collect one power instead. Otherwise, move Falgen two regions towards the focus region and he can fly over bodies of water here. I think I'm going to have Falgen actually head back north. And just like that, that is going to end out the action stack as the last card is an event card. A year of plenty. Place two power tokens in these two different regions. Two power tokens will be placed in the south region and two power tokens in the north region where Falgen just moved to. So as you can see, these event cards and some of the gameplay as it evolves is going to change your ability to manipulate things because now there are two different regions with two power tokens, which means there's still a tie, so I can still choose the focus region, but as soon as one of those other regions gets gobbled up in terms of its power tokens and there's just one with the most, then at that point I no longer get a choice and the other AI or faceless players are going to be gunning after those. Next we're going to move into the cleanup 
phase, but because this is going to be the end of the gameplay portion of the video, I do want to talk about a Dragon Bond. It's a very important strategic decision. It's also a very interesting one in terms of how it actually unveils or could potentially happen. It's not something that's just easily done as certain units, dragons and generals, work very differently in terms of the glyphs and how they activate and move around. And a Dragon Bond can only be resolved after an action card or if somebody retreated into an uncontrolled region and the two are sitting in there, a general and a dragon. So only in certain situations is that going to work out because in most situations resolving an action card may have combat happen which forces a retreat which then separates a general and a dragon from being in the same region. So it's going to be one of those situations in some cases where it's going to need, everything's going to be lined up strategically for you to land in the same area, have all the action cards on that. So let's just say hypothetically here we had an enemy show up in this location, there was a battle between two dragons, it had to move, it had to retreat somewhere, so the dragon goes ahead and retreats and retreats into my location right here. That particular turn resolved and then be able to try and do or form a dragon bond. So this is where a potential dragon bond can be formed. Each of the units are going to roll a single die. So we'll have the dragon roll first. You're rolling them at the same time, but you're looking for hits or critical hits. You just don't want to miss if you're trying to actually actively get a dragon bond. So there we did it. Both of the characters here in this location both rolled either a standard hit or a critical hit, which means they are now dragon bonded. However, if one of them had have rolled a miss, nothing would happen. Now, if Valeria really wanted this Dragon Bond to happen, then I could go ahead and consume one of my power tokens in order to re-roll the die. Now, the interesting thing to note here is you can use those powers in order to re-roll your die, whether you're trying to actively avoid a Dragon Bond or you want it to happen. So yes, there will be situations, especially when something is retreating into your location or just movement-wise, you end up in the same spot with something and you may not want to form a Dragon Bond with one of the dragons because maybe it's not as far along on the power track as the other one. So you're trying not to form that bond, so you might have to consume some power power in order to avoid it. If the Dragon Bond is successful, that General and Dragon are now permanent allies and cannot win alone. Each Dragon Bonded player flips their Dragon Bond card face up and places their new allies Dragon Bond token onto their player board for reference. So if the Dragon Bond was formed successfully, you take a look at Alaria's card here. This card would flip over and a token for the Dragon that is tied to this General would be placed there. There are certainly advantages to being Dragon Bond. You can see here when you flip your card over over after you've successfully done so, it states for Alaria, when your bonded dragon moves, they may move directly to the region you are in. If you move, you can move directly to where your bonded dragon is with all the units that are in the same region as you. A very powerful ability. And the token, I'm going to place that for the dragon that I bonded with. So that's how dragon bonding works. And it's worth mentioning again, these bonds cannot be broken in any way once they're set. So again, it's going to come down to, do you have power tokens in order to reroll to avoid a dragon bond you don't want? Or do you have the tokens you need to do the reroll at the specific time you want to actually have a dragon bond happen? There's a lot to think about and timing is going to be key, especially with the change of the requirements on the power tokens from 10 to 15. So in a bonded situation here, I'd be looking at both of these tracks here and we only have to make sure across both of these tracks, we've got 15 power tokens total. So now we move into the cleanup phase for the end of the round. After all cards in the action stack have been resolved, if the event deck in the top left hand corner is empty, the game is over and you proceed to the end game steps. Otherwise, each player is going to ensure their hand contains all their action cards again. So you're going to get all your five back for your generals or your six cards back for your dragons. And then additionally, on top of that, each general player has to make sure they have their region cards so that they have their total of six overall. Shuffle all the remaining unclaimed upgrade cards cards back into the upgrade deck and draw six new ones, placing them next to the board to create a brand new lineup. So the five upgrade cards that were not purchased, they're going to be shuffled back into the deck and we'll be placing out a new line of six. I thought it'd be worth you guys seeing some of the abilities of these upgrade cards up close now that you've seen the flow of the game. And that's it for the cleanup phase. And then you're moving straight back into the planning phase where you begin with an event card from the top of the event card deck, place face down, and everybody starting from the initiative marker 
onwards when solo play that'll always be you placing a card one at a time planning out what you plan to do during the next round of play all on a major goal of trying to accumulate as many power tokens as necessary to win the game based on whether you're dragon bonded or not and that, my friends, is going to wrap up this Kickstarter preview for Dragon Bond Lords of Vala from Draco Studios. Thanks again for watching. I really hope that the game overview, looking at the setup, walking through an actual full round of play and seeing it in action helps you get a good appreciation of what's going on here with the solo play. Let me know in the comments below what you thought of it and your opinions, feedback, positive or negative. I'd love to hear it. And it's also worth mentioning that this has already landed on Kickstarter. So if you want more information beyond this video, you can check that out again in the pinned comment or video description. Thanks again for watching and as always, keep on rolling solo!